For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Emily Gay. I'm the director of Pray NYC. Um, and Pray NYC is a movement of prayer here in the heart of New York City where we contend for revival. Um, and we, we believe that that's kind of built upon three pillars. And so the first is um, through prayer and worship. Uh, and so we have a prayer room actually currently that's online because of COVID. All of you are welcome to join. The information is on our website um, and it's open Monday through Friday. And the second is through equipping. We believe that God wants to disciple us just as Jesus had disciples. We want to make disciples um, in order to just transform our mind and lean more into revival to believe the things that God says are true, which is probably why you're here tonight. So we're so glad to have you. And then the third is through, through church unity. We just think that is so important to the heart of the Father. Um, and so we, we also lean into that. Um, so tonight, we are so honored to have um, our guest lead pastor, John Tyson, with us. He's the pastor of Church of the City here in New York. He also provides a strong apostolic voice here, um, and we're so grateful for his leadership. Um, he's also an author. His latest book out is called Beautiful Resistance. I highly recommend it. Um, maybe you can check that out after our webinar tonight. Um, but the thing that actually inspires me most about John, I actually I have the privilege of being a friend of his, and the thing that most inspires me about him is uh, just his holy imagination. And tonight, we wanted to give him... Um, give him space and time to kind of share with us how he's cultivated holy imagination in his own life. Um, you know, in Psalm 145, it says, uh, starting in verse four, it says, one generation will commend your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts, the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wondrous works. Um, and John is a person who meditates on the wondrous works of God. Uh, he has studied revivals all throughout the history, or all throughout like uh, church history, biblical history, and, and even our current day, uh, and has just produced so much inspiration in us to just believe that God can do more than we could actually ever hope, think, dream, or imagine, or even think to pray for. Um, so without further ado, John, please share with us. Well, uh, g'day everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, it is an absolute joy to be here with you tonight. What I'm going to do just to get started is I'll pray and then I'll open us up. So let's, uh, let's press in here. Father, we just come into your presence and we just say thank you. Lord, we just stand in awe of who you are and what you've done in history. And, and Father, we know in so many other parts of the world, you're still doing those things we've read about in manifest power. And yet, Lord, it, it just feels like in many ways where we are here in the West, there's just little dribs and drabs. We see glimpses of it and we say thank you for those, but we do just want to say we are hungry for more. And we just pray that you would take uh, events like tonight and you would use them to close the gap between what we read about and what we encounter. And we, we're just here to declare our love for you, our hunger for you. We want the attitude of our heart. We want the atmosphere of our life to, be, to just be one of desperation before you. So we thank you uh, for this time and just pray, Holy Spirit, fill it and use it. And Lord, I just pray for every person who's a part of this uh, Zoom call. Holy Spirit, I pray even now that you would just fill them with faith and vision. I just pray that you would manifest your presence as our hearts are united in faith wherever they are and that you would just release upon us all a spirit of prayer. And we just pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Okay. I John, are you interested in sharing your screen? It's totally fine. We are so happy to roll with you. Um, just yeah, let's, you... let's let, yeah, let's great. Let's get that screen. Let's, uh, let's see what we can do. Okay. Um, so if you wanted to share, your screen just at the very bottom of the um of like your zoom picture it should say share screen i think oh is it not is it not showing up mm -hmm. guys i'm so sorry this is emily is such a professional and this is me just trying to be a little bit too smart just a touch too smart and um 
Anyway, so um, no, no worries, no worries. And maybe you are. Maybe it's the formatting. Okay, that, I just thought we could get. So, can you see my? Can you see my face in the corner there? Can you see things coming up on the screen behind me in the corner? Actually, we there is some stuff coming up in the corner. Yes. Okay, let me just try this. That's okay. Look, That's is that even better? That is so much better. Okay. Oh, thank you so much for trying. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> No worries. Let's roll with it. Uh, I want to. I want to start um, with a quote, uh, just addressing this issue of what God's done in history, by really just asking us the question: um, Do you believe that this stuff is true? Do you really believe it? This is what Ian Bounds says. He says the prayers of God's saints are the capital stock of heaven, by which God carries on His great work upon the earth. <coughs> Do you believe that that is true? Is God utilizing the prayers of his saints, a kind of divine capital by which his work happens in the world? Wesley says this, one of his controversial statements, um, God does nothing but an answer to prayer. Now, this makes people who believe in particular sovereignty a little, comf uh, a little uncomfortable. But is there a principle to this? And then we get Jesus, who all through the Gospels, uh, whenever he is speaking about prayer, drops in these extraordinary promises. And I think if you read the Gospels, it is safe to say that the normative expectation that you and I should have about the kingdom of God in the world should be answered prayer as a default setting and expectation. When you read the Gospels, Jesus assumed it, Jesus promised it, and Jesus modeled it. So tonight I was asked or, or kind of uh, volunteered to speak on prayer that shapes history. Then if these things are really true, God utilizes our prayers and we are partnering with God's purposes to release them on the earth through prayer. We should expect that prayer can shape history. We have to have a conviction that when we look at the word authority and we ask the question, who is narrating the story of human history, that when we ask this question of authority, the answer is going to be quite simple. And it's this, God is the author and he is utilizing us. We are the instruments who through our prayer and obedience are receiving uh, answers to prayer and being a part of that. Prayer that shapes history. I think it's possible. And I think that God is utilizing what we do now whenever you use a, a claim like this because it's honestly quite a large claim prayer that shapes history what do we mean by that what do we mean by prayer that shapes history so i want to start by saying this i think the first thing that we are called to shape is our own personal history and the history of those that are around us i think we are called to very very clearly intercede to care for to love those who are around us shaping our own personal history. Uh, maybe uh, some of you have heard the story of my own conversion before. My personal history was radically shaped by my father's prayers. Um, somewhere around age 14, which I think in Australia, uh, in Australia is eighth grade. Um, I went to uh, our local public high school and so a pretty brutal jump from uh, elementary school straight into high school. I don't really have middle school uh, where I'm from. So I just got thrown in the deep end. I'm some like skinny, lanky little kid. And I get thrown in with seniors who have beards and a full body frame. And so something in me says, I'm going to need to adjust to fit in here or I'm going to be eaten alive. So I just basically do whatever it takes to get in with a bad crowd. I figure out pretty quickly who that is. I figure out pretty quickly what they do and, and off I go off the rails. This resulted in, in some behavior over a series of years <clears throat> that I would describe not, uh, not definitely not just as sinful and um, rebellious. Uh, we use the phrase brushes with the law, perhaps as a way to uh, sort of articulate uh, what my friends were into. And so on one particular encounter, the police show up at my home 
and they knock on the door and they say, does Jonathan Tyson live here? And my parents say, yes, why? And they said, oh, no big deal. We'd love to just have a chat with him if possible. Now this triggered something in my father's heart. Up until that point, he had basically tolerated this. He'd used various forms of, <clears throat> you know, attempts at discipline and punishment. And a lot of it was ineffective. And so my dad basically realized he was out of human resources. His human authority was failing to impact my life. His punishments were failing to impact my life. So he said, you know what I have to do? <coughs> I'm going to have to just contend for my son. I will shape my son's future and I will mark the history of his life by pleading with, for, uh, pleading with God for him in prayer. And so my dad was given this promise and it's a promise from the book of Isaiah 59. And it says this, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips and on the lips of your children and the lips of their descendants from this time on and forever. And my dad said, he said, I felt, he felt like he had a divine promise from God where God told him your children will serve me and your children's children will serve me. And as he was looking around, <clears throat> as he was looking around at uh, the state of my heart and the state of my life, something in his spirit just says, I have to press in and take a hold of this promise. If I don't do this, I'm going to lose my son. And so my dad began to, uh, to pray and to fast. He would get up in the morning. This went on for a period of months. He would get up in the morning and uh, he would walk up and down after I went to school. And he would walk up and down the house and he would say, in the name of Jesus, I am calling for the word of the Lord to be on the lips of my son, that his mouth will not be filled with cursing and rebellion, but that his mouth will be filled with the praises of God. And so uh, he prayed this promise, walking up and down, went into my bedroom, prayed over my room, prayed over my bed, <clears throat> just like went straight up Pentecostal. You know, you know the, the kind of parents anointing things with oil and slapping it on thick and creating an atmosphere and binding and loosing and pleading the blood and all the rest of it. And it was actually, actually extraordinary um, what began to happen in me internally. None of this I led on externally, but I basically began to have an internal crisis and conviction around uh, the issue of just my own personal rebellion. And uh, when I was about maybe seven or eight, one of my first memories ever was my, uh, was my grandfather, grandmother. My grandmother was a, a missionary in India. And uh, I have no real memories of her. She died of cancer when I was just, you know, right around the age of seven or eight. But she pulled me aside when I was young. And uh, she said to me, Johnny, God, she pulled me by a fireplace in Tasmania. And she said, Johnny, God has promised me that you were going to serve him. And when I was a kid, I was like, okay, whatever. It didn't mean anything to me. I had no uh, framework for it. So one night when I'm in the midst of my rebellion uh, and my dad's just praying for me, I go to this party. It is basically like the craziest party I've ever been to at this point in my life. And I get to this choice. I'm with a bunch of my friends and I'm either going to do what they do. And I'm consciously aware that if I participate in this behavior, my life will never be the same. I'm crossing a line from which I can never return. And it was super heavy. And I was sort of like inclined to go along with it. I was deeply torn, but I was like, you know, what's the point sort of a thing. And then I got, it's very hard to describe it almost like a new Testament vision, like such a strong impression of the Holy spirit of my grandmother saying to me, Johnny God's promise that you will serve me. And it just shook me. I could not participate in what my friends were participating. In. And I left, uh, left that party and went home just deeply shaken. And it was basically the start of my repentance and turning to God. And uh, so my dad, I didn't know this later, but my dad said he had, he had a list of things that he felt like God had promised for my life. And he prayed that every one of these, uh, you know, just pray through this list. And then he sat down after this period of crying out to me, fasting, seeking God, and everything that he had asked for on that list was fulfilled. And I am here today 
serving God because my personal history was shaped by my father's prayers. So if someone was to say to me, does, does, can prayer shape history? I say, yes, absolutely. Prayer can shape personal history. It can do it. It can radically impact the things that happen. So I just want to encourage you. You should be crying out to God in your life for the things that you believe he has put on your heart. God sows these promises. He comes along and he just whispers them into our ears, puts something in our spirit, puts it on our heart, puts a phrase, puts a word, puts a promise. And those are the things that we are called to, to push into and really believe God for. My, I am literally here just telling a testimony of the fact that my father's prayers shaped my history. Personal history can be shaped by fair, uh, prayer. Next one. We can shape family history. We can unleash generational blessing and favor through prayer. We can shape family history through prayer. Uh, I have a friend who's a pastor and uh, he grew up in a home with a <clears throat> described you know, non-believing parents. It was in the South. So they were like Christian esque, if you know what I'm saying, just sort of like that haunted Southern religion or whatever, but no serious faith. And um, somebody got a burden for my friend's father and just began to pray for him. Holy spirit, touch him. Holy spirit, turn his life around. Holy spirit. I want you to have your hand on this man. And this man was, um, I think a manual laborer, but sort of like a man's man and um, you know, Harley riding strong, rugged, that sort of a thing. And um, the Holy spirit just began to break into his life, began to touch him, began to completely melt his heart. And I uh, said, so my, my friend went, if you would listen to his testimony and you were to ask him, Tell me about how you basically ended up being who you are. How did you go into ministry? What happened? And he said, well, it was the craziest thing. One day my father said to us, I'd like all of you to please come into the living room. And so our family came into the room and my dad got down on his knees and told us that he'd given his life to Jesus and asked for forgiveness and then washed our feet and said, I want to be a better man. I want to serve you. I'm a follower of Jesus now. And he said it was from that point on that they started going to church. The entire trajectory of his life was changed. This happened because someone got a burden and began to pray for his father. And his entire history is shaped. Defining moment in his life because his father's on his knees washing feet and then bringing his family to church. And so prayer can shape our own personal histories. The prayers of the, uh, it can shape a history that's close to us. It has the power to shape our family histories. It also has the power to impact communities. There's so many stories in church history. One of my favorite ones is about the Ulster revival uh, that happened in Northern Ireland. Um, this was just a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And uh, basically there was four young men who were converted in a local community and they wanted to do something for God. And so a local pastor said to them, well, you could pray. Why don't you pray? And so these four young men began to cry out, uh, began to cry out to God that he would move them. In 18, 1859, the power of God came down uh, in one of their prayer meetings. So they gathered basically uh, at the encouragement of the Connor Presbyterian church for a series of just small prayer meetings at a schoolhouse. And what in January, 1858, they saw the first person converted as a direct result of a local prayer meeting, just with four young men. And in 1858, the attendance was around 50 by spring, 1859, there were 16 prayer meetings happening across the community. The revival spread in 1859 from one place to another place. And eventually over a hundred thousand people were converted in that particular community because four young men got a burden just to pray. They didn't know what God would do. They didn't know how it would work out. When I, my family went on a revival tour um, and we went over to Ireland and we stood and prayed in the place with the marks where this uh, schoolhouse started and it's in the middle of nowhere. It's almost impossible to find. And when we got there, we were, it, was, it was just a reminder that a few young men, brand new converts, no deep theology, no great understanding, no great leadership, just committed to pray because they were urged on. And their commitment to pray ended up resulting in an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that touched the entire region. And in fact, if you drive today, if you drive through that region, um, 
there's some towns that still have no bars in them still over 150 years later have no bars in them because of what happened in the revival and there's some towns that resisted the presence of the holy spirit and the move of god literally went down bypassed almost like a round apart the town that was critical and resistant and kept going and uh, one presbyterian minister who uh, basically told us the history of the revival that we bumped into when we were there basically showed us this the, the movement of the holy spirit based on the hunger of god so four young men with a vision start praying it completely transforms their community and so i i, I think sometimes we can we can underestimate the power of what it is that shapes the history of a family or a person or a region. Every body has an agenda for the future. Corporations have an agenda. Politicians have an agenda. Secular leader leaders have an agenda. Social media companies have an agenda. And the question I want to ask is like, where are the Christians with the agenda of heaven? And why aren't they pulling on the fulcrum of prayer? Because it has the power to shape things. And I, I really wish we see the truths of those earlier quotes, that our prayers are the capital on earth that God uses to break his kingdom in. One of the stories that I, that I honestly think uh, contains sort of the most extraordinary uh, example of uh, history being shaped through prayer is actually the breaking uh, down and fall of the Berlin Wall, part of the collapse uh, of communism. And uh, there's a town uh, in Leipzig. Uh, it's in a, it's about two hours from Berlin or so. And uh, here's a, a picture, a recent picture of the pastor uh, that led a prayer meeting. And his name is Pastor Führer. And he's actually, he's actually not that well known outside of the Christian church, but he was one of the absolute heroes of East Germany's peaceful uh, revolution. And you know, the brief history after World War II, um, basically there was a split between the East and the West. Uh, communism came in and was set up and um, Germany was split between East and West Germany. And uh, East Germany basically was uh, occupied by sort of communist powers and that they, they lived with a division. And uh, so that the, the uh, Berlin Wall was put up and it was basically like a psychological, not just a physical barrier um, that divided Berlin from 1961 to 1989. It was like a psychological barrier of two ways of thinking and two ways of life. And so Pastor Führer uh, was obviously in East Germany and he was pastoring, uh, pastoring a church there with some measure of resistance. And um, he was such a threat to the communist powers um, it was said that there were 28 Stasi, which was the uh, secret officers who were commissioned to spy on him night and day. And uh, he used to have spiky hair. And so they gave him the name of their hedgehog. And um, it was, he was in a, like an awful town, really polluted, nearly half a million people. And the whole thing was just like gripped by all pervasive fear. And, um, one commentator described the people in East Germany as psychologically destroyed. And so they just had this growing sense. Something had to change. Something had to change. And so he pastored a church called the Nikolai church. And every Monday he started these prayer meetings, very small, very humble called prayers for peace. So when they first started, there was between six and 10 people just looked like nothing. People with a broken heart, uh, psychologically destroyed people but they would basically given up any hope of real change and they said god you've got to break in you've got to act here as they began to pray and they began to get a sense of hope about having a different future communism falling freedom breaking in the meetings began to grow so in late 1988 the meetings grew from about 600 people to 4,000 people in september of 18 uh, sorry 1989 so one tiny uh, little prayer meeting with a handful of people grows into a, a basically a mega church prayer meeting. And it was seen as such a threat to the regime that on Monday, the 4th of September, members of the congregation put a banner outside that said an open country and a free people and a West German television show filmed this and millions of people saw what had happened. 
And so uh, they began to basically crack down on the like, okay, this prayer is such a threat. And so when he came to the church that Monday for the regular prayers, they found that 600 communist officials showed up with thermos and flask settling in to disrupt the entire prayer meeting. And they're reading the communist, uh, the communist um, uh, newspapers. So they began to warn them, if you don't shut, if you don't shut this down, we're going to basically massacre you. And you have to understand a lot of you are probably um, too young to remember this, but this is around the time of the Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square massacre in China. And uh, this is a time when um, there was tremendous fear of communist powers just cracking down with violent force, killing people. Uh, many people killed during the uh, Tiananmen Square massacre. And so when the communist government began to threaten them, it was very, very real and very, very costly. So they began to gather again to pray. And so despite the attempts, they said, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to march for freedom. So 6,000 people in and around the Nikolai church gathered. Um, and then they began to walk through the town, beginning to basically pray and call out for freedom in their country. That few little group uh, of, of, that started at six, grew to 600, then a crowd of 4,000 ballooned out to 65,000 people walking through the streets. The biggest anti-communist demonstration the country's ever witnessed. And um, the police, they basically feel like the police are about to massacre them down. And then nothing happens. Not a single bullet was fired. 45 minutes of protest. The crowd had grown to 70,000 people. And then they handed down, they basically unfilled a huge banner that said, we the people. And it later turned around that the police had called East Berlin to ask what would happen. They were basically going to unleash violent force, but the guy who was in charge of simply, the guy who was in charge of security simply missed the call. And so this was the turning point for the, the crumbling of the Berlin Wall. And so the pastor says this, the regime had been expecting everything. The only thing they weren't prepared for was candles and prayers. What is more, we got reunification and all demands of a free press, freedom of travel and a free society. So 15 days later, uh, in an October morning, more than 300,000 East Germans turned out on the streets of Leipzig. And then 11 days later, a million people came and they flooded the streets. And then the wall came down. And so the whole revolution was all built. There was other cultural forces outside of it, but it was triggered by one man saying, we have very little agency under this regime but we can pray and they prayed and they stuck with it and they asked God and the Berlin wall fell. One of the most uh, clearest memories um, from uh, sort of, you know, age 12, 13, that sort of thing in my life was going into uh, the mall and then all the TVs in every, uh, every shop, had the fall of the, the Berlin Wall and uh, the Scorpions, I believe that's the name of the band, uh, were playing a concert. And it was just like people were watching history, totally transformed, one pastor in a tiny church with a handful of friends praying. Now, I mentioned that because so often when we think about prayers that shape history, you know, there's, there's many examples you can bring up. You can have Esther and the way that she prayed. You can talk about Daniel's prayers. There's many instances in the Bible, uh, Hezekiah, Asa, uh, Josiah. These are people who cried out to God and God broke in and, and really did dramatic things. You've got the whole cycle of the judges where the people cry out to God and God acts. But sometimes that can be like, yeah, well, it's the Bible. It's so distant. I think we need to be reminded that God has the capacity to break in and to move in our lifetime now. And so gathering together and crying out to God and believing for that is actually possible. So the first part I wanted to talk about was this prayers that shape history. It's the history part I want to focus on. And I just want to encourage you that we can see God shape our family stories. The history of our families can be changed. Our own lives can be deeply marked by answered prayer. Communities can be touched by answered prayer and we can also see whole nations transformed, ideologies collapse. And so I always, I always tell people, you know, we are living in a time of history, particularly here in the U S where there's so such a need for genuine breakthrough. And it's like, 
yes, we should do all of the things within our human power to push for those things, but they are not a substitute for prayer. God moves through his people, utilizes the capital of prayer and can shape history through it. So the first part was about the history. The second thing I want to talk about connected to this just for a couple of minutes is about the kinds of prayers that shape history, the kinds of prayers that shape history. A lot of people are, a lot of people pray, a lot of people are committed to prayer, but it seems like in many ways, not a lot of it happens. Not, not a lot of it really, really changes. So is there a kind of prayer that in many ways we're not accessing that other generations have taken a hold of or leaned into that it sort of works these things out? And I, and I actually want to suggest, yes, there is. Most of our prayers fall into the category of abiding prayers or devotional prayers. And these prayers are important. These prayers are a gift. But these are not the only kinds of prayers that we are called to pray. There's another you know, set of prayers in the kingdom toolkit that get different results than just abiding prayers. Most of the abiding prayers are prayers for personal comfort and personal provision, which is, Lord, give me peace or give me strength to endure this situation. Jesus, I love you. I want communion with you. These are beautiful prayers, but there's another kind of prayers. Uh, another set of prayers. And these are the ones that I think in many ways are externally focused and have a huge, huge impact on shaping what happens. So what are some of these prayers? Uh, here's, I think, a few that are important for us to understand. Number one, these are just what I want to call covenant prayer. Covenant prayer. Um, I've said to people in our congregation before, um, if you've ever been around my wife and I, and if you understood her background and you understood my background, it would explain a lot about our communication style. I would describe our communication style as intense. And if you don't know us and you see us talking to each other, many times people will say, gee, you guys are really getting into it. And I was like, getting into it. What do you mean? It's like, gosh, you guys okay? And I was like, yeah, totally fine. We're just trying to figure out where to have dinner intense communication styles. My wife is an, an eight on the Enneagram. I don't know if you can put like eight in bold or capital eight. I don't know what the options are there, but she's a very strong eight. I'm from Australia. I worked in a meat factory with butchers. My communication style could be described as aggressive. And so we just get into it with one another sometimes. But I tell people all the time, if anybody talks to my wife in that same communication style without a relationship with her, I will turn into that butcher again. Don't talk to my wife like that. You don't have a relationship to do that. And if people talk to me like that, the way that she talks to me, she is going to apex predator step up and say, step down. That's my husband. Who do you think you are talking to the man of God like that? It's my wife. That's the way we uh, sort of talk with one another. It's covenant prayer. There's a level of commitment. There's a level of intimacy. There's a level of sort of energy that's committed to this thing. So you feel free to talk in a way because of your relational intimacy that you wouldn't with anybody else. And I'm often amazed at how formal our prayers are. You go to a typical church prayer meeting and the level of formality in many ways is extraordinary. And I, I, I love acknowledgements of the transcendence of God. High lifted up majestic but that's not the way jesus taught us to pray jesus prayers are aggressive they're pushing in the stories that he tells the stories the story of the persistent widow the story of asking and seeking and knocking these are stories of basically almost as one commentator put it like haggling in a market these are the prayers of covenant prayer and every now and then uh, i get around some of my friends who have this deep intimacy with Jesus. And I listen to their prayers and it's honestly kind of scary. It's not that there's a familiarity. They're not praying like, Hey God, dude, it, it, I want to be clear. They're not lowering God. They have such a level of intimacy. They're rising up in intercession and contending with God. God actually invites this various places in the scriptures. 
uh, he, he is looking for people to cry out. And I think that this is one of the things we have to recover. When you read Charles Finney on prayer, he is all about answered prayer by claiming our covenant relationship and our covenant inheritance. And um, this, this is when we start saying, because I'm in a relationship with you, God, I'm asking for this. This is what it says in Psalm 119. Streams of tears flow from my eyes for your laws not obeyed. There's a reference point here that because I'm in a relationship with you and my community is supposed to be, the church is supposed to be in a relationship with you. Your law is not being obeyed. Therefore, I'm weeping because of the failure of your people to uphold your covenant. And uh, I, I think there's so much power in praying these covenant prayers. And that's why it's so important to understand and study the beauty of the new covenant. What does it mean that the spirit is within us? His law is written on our hearts, that we have an inner witness that in, in the old covenant, it is you shall, you shall, you shall. It's the 10 commandments. You read the promises of the new covenant. It says, I will, I will, I will. And so we are living in the glorious side of the new covenant. We've got to lean into that wrestling with God, crying out to God contending with God, prayers of covenant. I think probably the most historical uh, example of covenant prayer that I love is uh, prayer in the Hebrides. And um, the Hebrides revival is my favorite revival. And if people were to say to me, what are you wanting to see God do in New York? I would say if I had to put on paper, uh, a, like a, a point in history, it would be what God did in the Hebrides revival just the manifest presence of God, a tangible zone of the manifest presence of God where people could not escape an encounter with God. They could not escape an encounter with him. Uh, I, I put something on uh, Twitter today, uh, just talking about uh, my time in the Hebrides. And uh, when I was over there, I couldn't talk to the people uh, without them weeping. 70 years since the revival happened, and they would say the name Jesus and I would still get choked up because it was so real to them. And uh, they were living, they were living on, on covenant prayer. And um, one of the guys said this, this is what, um, this is what Duncan Campbell said. He said, the grass beneath my feet and the rocks around me seemed to cry, flee to Christ for refuge. This supernatural illumination of the Holy Spirit led many in this revival to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ before they came near to any meeting. So he says the grass seemed to say, repent and give your life to Jesus. And this whole prayer meeting was launched in covenant prayer. And there was two uh, elderly women, Peggy and Christine. They felt God gave them this promise. I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing and your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. Some will say, I belong to the Lord. Others will call themselves by the name of Jacob. Still others will write on the hand, the Lord's, and will take the name of Israel. And they were so heartbroken that there was no young people in any of their churches. They just said, God, you got to break in. And then one night in one famous scene, um, there was a, a uh, blacksmith very, very godly man, one of the elders in the church. And uh, he was in a part of town where there was no work of the Holy Spirit at all. And um, God came down and uh, because he's got in a prayer meeting and he just said this, he said sort of, this is paraphrased. Lord, you promised that you would pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground and you're not doing it. And it's not our reputation. This is not our word. It's not our promise. It's yours. Now come down, God, and keep your word. And they said the very building shook. And then when they went outside, the village had spontaneously gathered. And many people gave their lives to Christ that like. That is covenant prayer. It's literally going up into heaven and pulling down the inheritance that is promised by Jesus for us. And so to me, that's why it's always so important to pray God's word, to read it until you get that sort of rhema burning promise from God where he speaks to you from his word. And then to put that down and then to cry out to him. I've got my, this is, this is my, uh, my intercession Bible right here. This was a gift from my team. And uh, in it, I've got a map of New York that I spread out and I sort of stand over the map and uh, pray over the whole city. And I have this thing set. I've got my bookmark set to covenant promises. I believe God's given me for the city of New York. 
And I step in and I say, Lord, this is what you've said. This is not my word. I hold it up. This is your word, Lord God. When will you act? And uh, so I want to encourage you, pray those. Get a covenant promise. Get one. Seek God for a word that you can use as a lever to pull on through prayer and fasting and intercession to see God break in. Those are important prayers. Next kind of prayer, uh, very, very connected to this. These are uh, uh, prayers for God to intervene. And uh, again, this, this comes when people basically cannot tolerate the spiritual status quo. This is when, when people basically say, God, you got to come in. And these are intense prayers. I'm often reminded when you look at the New Testament in James chapter five, it says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So let that hit you in a fresh way. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So it carries something and there should be an outcome. But so when James is writing this, you know, who could James have referenced as an example? Oh, it's, it's Elijah. Yeah, Elijah saw some pretty good stuff. Elijah saw heaven shut up. He saw heaven released. He saw fire fall from heaven. But how did that happen? Elijah didn't say one line of prayers. You know what happened with Elijah? He had to get on his knees in that Hebrew birthing position and just cry out for rain. Even when God gave him a promise, he still had to contend for that intervention. And so he sends the servant. Is there any rain? No. So he gets back down, sends the servant. How about now? No, he gets back down. This went on seven times. And so James says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Uh, again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain, the earth produced crops. So these sort of prayers for God to break in, send rain, stop things, start things, change things. This is a prayer to see God break in and to change the reality of where we are. So I would encourage you as well to, to pray those prayers of intervention that God would disrupt the moment. My current prayer right now, if you were to ask me, what am I praying? Where am I praying for God to intervene? Here's, here's my basic grid. The world has been disrupted. There's never been a better time for biblical revival than right now because everything's already disrupted. So we don't have to, like we've already disrupted our services. We've already disrupted how we're working. We're already utilizing technology, which Jonathan Edwards believed was going to be one of the, the keys to the coming of the kingdom of Jesus, the utilization of technology. We are so primed for something to happen, but all we need is God to intervene. So all the conditions in the natural are right for God to just pour on it. But will he? I think in some sense, it depends if we pray those intervening prayers. And then lastly, we're almost out of time here. Um, it's united prayer. And I want to be clear here. United prayer doesn't necessarily mean prayer by the thousands. I think it's just prayer where a few people connect their hearts. If thousands connect their hearts, it's an unstoppable force. But it's when people gather in faith around the promises of God and they contend together. And so to me, I think um, this is a huge part of what we need to do in the moment. And I think a huge part of the enemy is to bring division. And he'll use anything. He'll use racism to divide the church. He'll use anti-racism to divide the church. He, he will use any factor. He, he, he will use good things. He will use bad things, whatever he can do to bring division. And so that's why it's so important that we are humble. That's why it's important that we are repentant. That's why it's humble that we cherish one another. That's it's, it's so important that we make our primary relationships with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and not secondary sociological or other factors. We have to see each other with a fierce loyalty. I think biblical unity is like the nuclear level power against the enemy. And so he will just use anything to stop it happening. And that's why when it says in Ephesians 4 that we are to keep the bond of the spirit and we've got to keep it because the default is to fracture back into human factions. And uh, so I want to encourage you if, if there's anything in your heart against other people, whether it's because of race, whether it's because of socioeconomic factors, whether because it's somebody else's theological position, repent of self-righteous 
judgment against others and humble yourself and work for unity. A united church is an unstoppable force in the world. So can prayer shape history? Yes. It can shape your personal history. It can shape the history of your family. It can shape a community. It can shape a nation. What kinds of prayer shape history? Covenant prayers, prayers for intervention, and united prayer. And I think that if we recover these things, um, I think that God could really do something important. Now, I want to just say something to you, and you obviously care about this uh, because you wouldn't be on this call, but these are not default opinions of people, and these are not the default kinds of prayers that people pray. And so I want to just challenge you get in those mediocre prayer meetings and mess them up with hunger get in there pray push in cry out to god lift up the word let's change the normal culture of prayer and uh make it the kinds of prayer that god asks us to shape history okay grace and peace everybody emily back to you <laughs> john thank you so much my my spirit is stirred um and thank you everyone for joining us uh we do have a few more minutes before we're going to be ending our time together um so john is it okay if i ask you a few questions as a follow-up yeah, sure. okay yeah, sure. um Okay, so something that you referenced through through each point of history, personal history, um, family history, et cetera, was just having these divine promises from God. Um, and so I was wondering if you would share with us kind of how, how do you know if a promise is of God or from God that you can like press in for? Would you, do you mind sharing about that? Yeah, so I, I basically... Part of it is the attitude with which you approach the reading of God's word. Mm. So you can shoehorn something. You can pick up a Bible promise book and claim it and nothing will happen because that's not a Bible promise book. What that is, is an alphabetized or topicalized collection of verses in one place. That is very, very different than a promise from heaven. The hmm. promise from heaven is when you're reading the word and as it says in Hebrews 4, it's living and active and it, it hits your spirit in a fresh way. It is, it is, um, it's a, an experiential awareness and knowledge. And so it is, it is kind of hard to articulate, um, but you just know there's something on that passage for me. Or, you know, you're crying out and God presses it on your heart. I will often ask, so, so basically it comes by reading, meditating and praying mm. and something stands out. Then I will often ask for confirmation. Okay, Lord, this is your word. And I'm from the charismatic tradition, so I can handle the, a little bit of sort of weird subjective stuff. But whenever I'm praying a promise, I pray, confirm this. Have somebody else send me this, text me this, like give me Give me this same verse from other people. When I start seeing that triangulated, so I have the inner witness, I have the reading of God's word with hunger, and then I've got people basically feeding that passage back to me. It's on. Wow. It's on. So I, um, oh, I mean, I got, it's, it's hard to articulate. I feel like I'm living in the book of Acts right now. I'm seeing such dramatic answers to prayer. I, I, it's like hard to even share them. Um, but mm. these were, these were triangulated. I yeah. felt God put something in my spirit. I had a prophetic friend say something to me and then I had it confirmed from God's word. And then I'd so basically when, when that happened to me, I started fasting. I was like, I'm going after this. I am going after this. And sure enough, miracles, yeah. miracles. Wow, that, yep. that's, that's really helpful, John. Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I could just, I just want to encourage everyone, like if you want a promise from God, you should ask him for those. I think he like really wants to give us those. I mean, um, yes. I mean, look at what it says. It says that he's given us his great and precious promises. I mean, yeah. if, you want a, if you want a passage to lean into, th I, I think this one to me is like almost shaking. This yeah. is second Peter one, three, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him 
who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world that's caused by evil desires. So, and then it goes into like basically promises lead to a virtuous pursuit. And the fruit of that is that when you enter into the kingdom of heaven, you receive a warm welcome and it will keep you from being, here's the words, ineffective and mm -hmm. unproductive in your knowledge of Christ. Get into that passage. Wow. Yeah. That's so good. Um, okay, so another question. So, John, I, I really liked how you set up kind of just like almost the spectrum of prayer, right? Like on, on one side, which is so good and helpful, and we do need this, but this like abiding prayer, um, and then kind of like on the other side of the spectrum, these like covenant, uh, covenant prayers, intervening prayers, united prayers. So um, what would you say to a person who's like actually like, I, I'm way over here and I love being over here. Um, but like, maybe like just hearing you talk, I'm like, okay, maybe I could try to come over this way. So like, what would you say for someone who's going to try to take baby steps over here? Um, get around people who pray, get around people who have spent more time with God than you don't just do it on your own. You learn so much by praying with other people, um, read, you know, the, the, I'm always fueling my faith by reading biographies mm -hmm. of people in history and how God used them. So I've, I've shared this all over the place. So forgive me if this is repeat, um, but I read the biography of uh, James O. Frazier, who was a missionary to the Lasso people in China um, at the start of COVID. And it shook me. And I mean, by shook me, I mean, I actually had COVID at the time. So I was super sick laying in bed, but I was in bed just like shaking and weeping, reading his biography. And I, my cry was, God, give me a heart for prayer like that. And so you, you get read the saints of history and then just like it's, it says, um, uh, remember that, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And uh, so that's how I learned to do it. I was like, okay, so a lot of people went up on hills early in the morning. So I'm going to go find a hill and pray on the hill. There's many, many mornings where I was like, it's cold and I'm actually scared. This is like kind of scary, but I was like, I learned by doing. Yeah. And, um, and again, in Ephesians 5, 1, at 1 and 2, and it took, it says, be imitators of God. And it's a Greek word, mimitates, mimic, literally copy. It's like how a baby learns. They do what they see the people who are around them doing. Mm -hmm. It's like the good version of mimetic desire. And um, so just do those things, do little experiments and don't moralize them. Just do them for fun. Try them, you know? So not, not like in the flesh, like I have to just like do it as a fun experiment and see what happens. So I think God will grow your capacity over time. John, that's so helpful. Thank you. Um, well, I do want to honor everyone's time. So we are going to wrap up. Uh, John, would you just would pray over everyone who is with us now, just that we um, would just have a greater holy imagination for what God can actually do? Yes, sure. Okay. If Look, man, I don't know how this works. I just know it's in the Bible. Um, I don't even know how to articulate it, but I, I believe I have like a gift of intercession, which means I feel like God gave me divine enabling um, when I was a new, this is just set up for the prayer. Um, when I was a new Christian, um, it was, I was in an assemblies of God church and you know, the, uh, according to the 16 articles, speaking in tongues is like one of the proofs that you feel with the Holy spirit in the assemblies of God. And so I, like I could, everybody would like, you know, I was a new convert. So I was a prize. So I, there was probably like a pool on who can pray for John and get him filled with the Holy spirit. And, um, and I was like, don't freaking touch me. If you touch me, I'll slap you. Do not. I was so suspicious of it. So I said to God, if this is real, I want you to give me the gift of tongues on my own. And so I was at work one day and I was praying, crying out to God. And, um, and I just felt like a lightning bolt from heaven come through the roof, fill my body. I was like a river of a non-voluntary response, an involuntary response. 
I'm just uh, praying out loud. And then God basically began to give me these prayer burdens where I'd be driving my car and it was literally, uh, I would have to pull my car over and pray in tongues at the top of my lungs until it left. And it was so crazy. I'm like 18 years old driving home from Mickey D's and I'm like, got to pull over. Oh God. And just like cry out to God. And so I've carried that my whole life. You know, there's many times in New York where I'll be out praying in the morning and I just have to stop. My heart is broken. So here's what I want to pray. I just want to pray that God will give you that same gift. And so I don't know how it works other than in the, the Bible, it says that you can get an impartation or something. So this is like a virtual laying on of hands. So if you, if you're like, I am hungry for that gift of intercession. And I just want to just say, put your hands out wherever you are. I've done this with people before and it's happened in the UK. It's like happened to people and they've received it from America. So I, it's only God that can do it, but let me just, just pray that. So father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you Lord God, by the power of the Holy spirit will fill the people who were on this call with the gift of intercession. Come Holy spirit to those whose hearts are sincere and hungry. And even now, Lord God, as these people lift their hands to you, I just pray literally that anointing from heaven would come upon their hands and fill their hearts and fill their bodies and that you would just give them a gift of contending prayer. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just take whatever it is in me that you've put in me, it's not from me, whatever you've put in me that causes me to set my alarm, that causes me to walk the streets, that... that gives that hunger lord it's only from you i just pray in the name of jesus just release it right now into the hearts of people who have taken the time in the middle of the week to hear about prayer come holy spirit holy spirit you're the spirit of prayer you're the one who prays with groans too deep for words and so i just pray just release this anointing this gift, this hunger, whatever it is, into the hearts of these people. And Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would give them promises from your word. Lord, even now I'm just asking that promises would just appear in their mind, Lord God. And I just ask Holy Spirit that they would see their lives, their family, their community, and the nation they serve in changed by the power of prayer. Just bless them now. Send your spirit upon them. We just wait on you, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, impart this now. And if you want that, just receive it. Just say, I receive this, Lord. I receive all that you have for me. Just take a moment and do that by faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you want to pray through us. Thank you that you want to use us. We're available. We want to be the capital of fuel for the coming kingdom at this time of history on earth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John, thank you so much for such an intentional prayer. Um, No worries. Thank you. Yes, I really. Thank you, Emily. Pray NYC. Love (laughs) everything that you're doing. Thank you, Pastor John. Um, Yeah, everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you want to hear more from John, um, he's actually written quite a few books, and I would love for you to check those out. His latest, as I mentioned earlier, is called Beautiful Resistance. He also wrote The Bird in His Life, The Creative Minority. You can find all those on Amazon. Um, Definitely, definitely worth the read. So, yeah, join us next time. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. See you, everybody.